If you've been subscribed to this channel for a while, then you know I tend to speedrun a lot of games from my childhood, primarily 3D platformer licensed games. But the game series I have some of the most playtime in are definitely the Call of Duty games. World at War, Modern Warfare 2, Modern Warfare 3, and Black Ops 2 used to be some of my most played games. Obviously, usually playing multiplayer with my friends online. But just as much as I enjoyed the multiplayer experiences, I also finally looked back on those cold winter days where my internet would go offline, which would be the perfect opportunity to play these games' campaigns. Surprisingly, the campaigns in these games go pretty hard. They're theatrical, have good stories, and the gameplay is genuinely fun and challenging. Modern Warfare 2 was always my favorite out of the games, and I was really curious what a speedrun of this game would look like, so in today's video, I'm going to give you all a deep dive into what it takes to speedrun a game like this. First, let's talk about the most important aspect of Modern Warfare 2 speedrunning, which is strafing. Learning how to properly strafe is crucial to the speedrun, since we're going to be doing this in every area that involves running. Holding W and A and turning left at the same time gives a massive boost to your speed, and the same goes for holding W and D and turning right. And by combining this with a jump at the peak of the ground speed, creates an air strafe, which preserves the ground speed in the air. While in the air, you can also add to your air speed by moving in the correct direction relative to your current velocity. So if you're going straight forward, this is roughly diagonal. Starting another strafe before you land will preserve even more speed, and allow you to spend minimal time on the ground while also getting a good amount of velocity. For reference, the value for walking speed is 190, sprinting is 285, a really good ground strafe with good FPS is 360, and a good air strafe can reach up to 400. In areas where you're unable to strafe jump, such as the end game, spamming and alternating between left and right to wiggle forward will make you move slightly faster. Strafing is way more difficult than it looks, not just in moving in the correct direction, but the timing window for max speeds is very precise. The next thing I want to talk about is the FPS cap that all speedruns must be played on. Throughout the game, specifically when starting a breach, a slow-mo effect will play out, but can be ended early by switching weapons or using equipment. While this effect can be cancelled, high frame rates, specifically frame rates above 500, will make slow motion sections play out faster than originally intended, thus creating a time save if your PC is able to handle it. Since this technically can be viewed as a hardware advantage, it was decided back in July of 2022 to hard cap all future speedruns to 250 FPS. Because of this ruling, the community decided to have all top 10 times on the leaderboard to be retimed in order to be fair. The last thing I wanted to mention is while not being important to the standard any percent category, a speedrun mod without cutscenes was created back in 2022 by Pandas and Survivor, which is more gameplay oriented than the base game. By cutting out all cutscenes and general RNG, it's possible to beat the game in under 40 minutes, which means nearly half the game is unskippable cutscenes if you're playing the standard any percent category. Now let's get onto how the run is primarily played. The main speedrunning category is any percent on recruit difficulty which is basically the entire campaign on easy mode. The first reason for this is because Recruit is the most consistent out of the four difficulties, whereas the hardest difficulty, Veteran, can be unpredictable. With Veteran difficulty, it's very possible to have a great run even if you are a less skilled player, and this is mostly due to luck, specifically whether or not the enemies are hitting you. The second reason is simply that Recruit is the fastest difficulty, and for any percent, that's all we really care about. Another important thing to note is that velocity is required to be shown on screen for all top runs. While this can aid a player in determining if their movement is optimal, this is actually an anti-cheating measure to ensure that players aren't hacking their speed and getting impossible movement. Lastly, the gameplay we're watching is from Survivor, who has a third place time in the leaderboards, so shoutouts to them for letting me use their video. Anyways, we start our first mission in the level SSDD, playing as Ranger Joseph Allen. We take control of an M4A1 and engage in target practice. All that matters here is hitting the first two targets as quickly as possible, as the others are capped behind Sergeant Foley's dialogue anyways. Once we're done with target practice, we position ourselves to stand on the left side of Foley as he moves out of the way, which will give us the least chance to get stuck on anyone, and then run over to Corporal Dunn, who's located at the pit. This is the first section that's entirely movement based, so this is where strafing first comes into play. In the pit, Dunn will open up the weapon cases, and we'll want to grab the MP5 and the M9 to run the course as fast as possible. As a quick note, most weapons in campaign don't affect your overall speed. However, all assault rifles will slow you down, except for the AK-47 and M16 unless they're in grenade launcher mode. For example, if we have an M4A1 Grenadier in regular shooting mode, we'll sprint slower. But if we switch it to grenade launcher mode and sprint, our speed is unchanged. Other weapons such as launchers and light machine guns, excluding the L86 LSW, are perfectly fast to use. After completing the course, Dunn stops us to select our difficulty, and of course we choose Recruit. Sergeant Foley yells to the squad to ready up, and the screen blacks out as we presumably prepare for battle. 
The next mission is Team Player, and we wake him from shell shock on the ground due to our vehicle being destroyed by an RPG. General Shepard helps us up, and we make our way to this dumpster and jump on top of it. When Sergeant Giesler leans out of the way, we fall down behind him, and then when Foley finishes his dialogue, we start moving right and add a straightforward jump to gain more height. If done correctly, we land on a small electrical box, and from there can jump to the roof and onto the stairs. This allows us to kill the enemies that spawn across the bridge more easily, and triggers a cutscene for the Humvee to appear early, saving a whole half of a second. The next three minutes is essentially an auto-scroller riding the Humvee. However, it is possible to die in this section if you get really unlucky. The most likely cause of death would be from an exploding vehicle, so if you do shoot any enemies, it's best to avoid the cars at all costs. At the end of the driving section, our Humvee gets shot by an RPG, and when this happens, it's important to spam jump while moving forward and right, and then jump twice to enter the doorway. While stunned, it's faster to jump than walk, and it's also possible to overwrite the stun by flashing, so we throw a flashbang while moving. This is just a normal run through a group of enemies, shooting down anyone that may get in the way. There is an option to pick up the RPD, which is a safer choice, but more experienced players will complete the level just using a pistol, instead of stopping to change weapons. The wooden alley towards the end has lots of geometry to collide with on the walls and ceiling, so it's important to crouch jump when strafing, and to keep distance from the wall to ensure we don't get stuck. As we reach the rally point, General Shepard informs us that we'll be taking orders from him now. Now, if you're a fan of the Call of Duty games, then today's video sponsor War Thunder is perfect for you. War Thunder is a free-to-play combat game for the PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and S. Rather than strafe hopping around a bunch of enemies, in War Thunder, you'll be able to take your battles to the sea, land, and the sky, and battle with over 2,000 different types of vehicles, including tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, either with local play, or you can match up with other players in online PvP. And like I said before, this game is completely free to play. You can literally open up Steam right now, and by the time this video ends, you'll be flying around, taking down enemy aircraft in no time. The customization system is also really cool. There are literally hundreds of different camos and markings to apply to your vehicles. The graphics are great, it's easy to get into, and the battles are really intense. Check out my link in the description to download this game and take advantage of the free bonus pack that comes along with it. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring my video, now let's get back into the content. The level cliffhanger begins with us now playing as Roach. As the level fades in from a black screen, we scoot around Soap at the start to save a few seconds. Afterwards we slowly ascend up the ice mountain, and then run to the gap on Soap's right. After nearly falling to our death, he extends his arm to help us up. Once we've successfully climbed up the mountain, we switch to our pistol and kill the first two enemies to skip a line of dialogue. While strafing to the base, we're able to jump up on this jeep because it allows for a faster route to the next waypoint. Then at the next waypoint, we plant C4, which we'll be detonating in just a moment. After a bit of strafing to the third waypoint, we link back up with Soap and enter the hangar. Here we need to shoot the first enemy before Soap tackles him, because if we don't, he'll enter a lengthy animation. There's an ACS module that we need to collect, and en route, there's plenty of things to collide with, so it's better to just run without jumping in the smaller room. Once the module is retrieved, we hop onto this barrel and scoot back to give some space to cleanly strafe jump off of it. At this point, Russian soldiers hold Soap at gunpoint, and the base commander Major Petrov threatens to kill him if any soldiers that were with him do not surrender in 5 seconds. As Petrov says 5, we can save another half second by pulling out our heartbeat sensor, allowing us to use the C4 slightly sooner. As we make a run for it, we'll head down this hill, and since we're moving so fast to get here, there should be enough of a gap that Soap just teleports over. But in rare circumstances, he can actually flat out disappear entirely, which would be a level ending softlock, as seen here. However, if Soap cooperates, all we need to do is shoot enemies as they appear atop the hill. We do need to be careful when shooting snowmobiles, because they can tumble and kill us if we make contact. And if they hit Soap, it will make him stumble, which loses a bit of time. After laying waste to enemies, we mount a snowmobile and our end destination is roughly 2000 meters away. An enemy helicopter flies overhead, so we'll need to avoid getting hit. This entire sequence relies on taking a proper path to our end destination, which is a Kilo 6-1 and our ticket out of here. And with the right amount of practice, it's fairly easy to not bump into any trees. Towards the end, we aim between the little tower and the antenna. The tree stumps aren't solid, but we need to be mindful that we aren't driving into any allies, since killing enough of them will fail the mission. Taking the slight gap saves around a second, so experienced runners will always opt in for the strat. And then who can forget about the next mission? No Russian. In this level, we play as Alan again, this time undercover, accompanying Makarov, who commands us to kill every Russian in an airport. The level is extremely graphic as you walk through the airport slowly with machine guns, killing every civilian in sight. 
But apparently this level is too graphic, as it is completely optional and was censored in international versions of the game, including its entire removal from the Russian versions. Lore-wise, the level ends with Makarov killing Alan, leaving his body behind, blaming the entire massacre on the Americans. And this was Makarov's plan all along, to fan the flames of a brewing war between Russia and the US. But since we're not required to play this level, and the level would be slow and boring as hell to speedrun anyways, we can just go ahead and skip it and move on to the next mission. In the mission takedown, General Shepard sends Task Force 141 to Brazil to capture Alejandro Rojas, the weapon supplier for Makarov. However, they're unaware of Rojas' exact location, so they need to capture his assistant first. We once again take control of Roach, and it's important that we're crouched here. This is always done preemptively out of habit, otherwise us and the driver are killed at the start of the level. The second thing to do is to line up the window shot on Rojas' assistant after exiting the vehicle. We aim a little left of the wooden beam and start firing as soon as possible. If Soap doesn't interrupt his own dialogue to say, he's down, then that means we miss a shot and we'll have to load the last checkpoint to try again. The rest of takedown is entirely movement based, with the occasional enemy that needs to be shot out of the way, but runners will need to be careful to avoid shooting civilians. Sometimes the game will give leniency if a civilian is accidentally killed, but it's far more often if mission will fail if it happens. There's not really a whole lot to note in this level, except in the end when we run up the final set of stairs. We need to look at Soap and Rojas to start the ending animation, but then quickly turn around to avoid the slow motion cinematic. With Rojas captured, Ghost tries to call for extraction, but is unable to do so due to the war erupting in the US. None of the men appear to be aware of it, and Ghost feels that they have been abandoned. Act 2 begins with the mission Wolverines, and is by far the hardest mission as it will take the most time to figure out completely. The Russian government has declared war in the United States, seeking revenge for the deaths of hundreds of innocent civilians killed at the airport. The Russian strike force snuck into the east coast undetected, which catches the US military off guard. We play as James Ramirez, a member of the 1st Battalion 75th Ranger Regiment, alongside Sergeant Foley and Corporal Dunn in the suburbs of Northern Virginia. The main way speedrunners save time on this mission is through dialogue skips, where certain objectives need to be completed so quickly that certain dialogue never occurs. The mission starts with a BTR appearing and it begins firing at the rangers. Everyone gets out and the rangers in the lead vehicle are killed. We immediately switch to our pistol and start sprint jumping the moment the Humvee is destroyed. It's important to be mindful of the various street curves throughout the level as they are very good at eating jump inputs. The first enemy that runs around the corner is primed to target us, so we shoot them but we're going to mainly avoid other enemies since killing them will raise the chances of south truck spawning, which can lose nearly a minute. Later in the level, we'll need to clear the south wave before the north wave can spawn, however the best scenario would be to not have any enemies spawn in the south at all. We take this path through the gas station and then around the left side of Nate's restaurant. This will spawn even more enemies to further ensure that the south trucks don't spawn. Once we're on the roof of Nate's, we grab the turret and wait for Corporal Dunn to say that there are trucks to the north. Afterwards, we head over to the bank parking lot and point the turret at the truck closest to the bank. Next, we run to the diner and grab the AK-47 and M240. Then we wait for the Predator controller to spawn on the right side of the counter. With the Predator missile, we aim to hit the higher side of the wall between the two BTRs. Now we need to get onto the street as fast as possible, or else Foley will have some extra dialogue, costing about 3 to 4 seconds. From here, we make our way over to protect the most important location in the game, Burger Town. It needs to be cleared out before Foley says, to secure the Burger Town, or else we lose time. Then we return to the gas station and kill any extra enemies that are too close to it. We have until Foley says, go, 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 to pick them off. The Predator drone is used once again while standing out of view of the street, facing the window of the diner. The missile can't hit the ground until Foley has completed his countdown, or else his dialogue will be interrupted, costing even more time. Now we need to kill any enemy we see in order to have as few of them on the map as possible. We grab the stinger located in the diner, then make our way to the bus stop on the other side of the diner, stopping every so often to use a predator if necessary. While waiting for Foley to enter Burger Town, we stand in the far corner of the bus stop and open the predator drone, but we must not shoot any missiles when he is close to completing his path. Three waves of enemies will now spawn, with each one spawning as soon as a game saver checkpoint reach notification appears. If we only use one predator missile per wave and successfully kill all enemies, we can set up a skip that saves anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds. Once the third wave is complete, we make our way to the far edge of the map, climb on top of the base of a light post, and then a bush. This positioning is very important since the closer we are to the helicopter spawn, the better. Normally we're supposed to use a stinger twice on the helicopters, but instead we can use the predator to eliminate the first helicopter, and then the stinger once to eliminate the second helicopter, which saves 10-15 to 15 seconds. 
Then we run back towards Burger Town and wait on the right side of the fire truck by the road. This can't be done in time without strafing, but by this point, it isn't too hard. When the convoy spawns, the rangers exfil out to Arcadia to save and evacuate civilians caught in the fighting. The next mission is Hornet's Nest, which is a bit of a breather compared to the last mission since it's entirely movement based. Alejandro Rojas has been tortured and says a person that Makarov hates the most is locked in a Russian gulag and goes by prisoner number 627. Task Force 141 decides to find the prisoner, but due to the Russian-American war, the US can't send out a squad to pick them up. Therefore, Soap calls Nikolai, the leader of a private military company, to pick them up. However, heavy RPGs force Nikolai to break away and leave temporarily, but he'll be back. Playing once again as Roach, we have to follow the intended path all the way to the market, and there's a near zero chance of dying unless we get meleeed. We can purposely shoot in front of any teammates to stagger them backwards out of our way so we can get into this house more easily. Crossing the second to last doorway out of the house will trigger the next sequence, which involves climbing on top of the pallet next to the door. Four enemies will spawn on the roof, and we have to kill them to maximize our chances of going through the next section as fast as possible. When the door opens, we can jump on top of it to get onto the roof ahead of Soap and the others. Next, we just pray that our teammates kill the remaining enemies in time. This generally always happens, but we also need to be sure that Soap says, come on, we've got to get to the rooftops, before falling off the roof. To avoid the animation of missing the jump, we can either turn around so our back is to the next roof, or strafe off to the sides. We then land on the ground and immediately get a black screen. And from here we just run to Nikolai's helicopter and escape the favela. In the mission Exodus, there are two ways to complete it. The first way relying heavily on luck, while the second one is pretty much entirely skill dependent. The RNG route was actually the only route available up until mid to late 2022, when the skill dependent route was discovered by Survivor. I'll only be focusing on the skill dependent method, as this is more preferred in speedruns, and it's faster anyways. Playing as James Ramirez, we first run through the level as normal, and shoot a sentry gun that's a bit up the road. Once we enter the second residential area right after the bridge, we perform an out-of-bounds glitch to get on top of the roof of this house. When jumping off the roof, we have to be extremely careful not to drop down too early, or too much to the right. This is because there are two triggers extremely close to the point where we drop off, and hitting them will make this route not work. After jumping off the roof successfully, we continue through the level as normal. There's a safe room that we enter, and must go as far as seeing the high value individual, since there's an important trigger here. After this, we return back to the spot of the out of bounds glitch, and perform it once more. At some point during the process of performing it, Foley should say, Ramirez, get that briefcase. What's left of it? This is confirmation that we can now pick it up. Instead of dropping down near the garage entrance, we want to drop down to the other side of the barrier. Now we can run back to the safe room and pick up the briefcase. The story here is that Victor from Makarov's inner circle was sent to participate in the Russian invasion of the United States, and was killed by the high value individual. But the other Russian soldier managed to kill the HVI before he could escape. When Sergeant Foley and his squad were sent to rescue the HVI, the other Russian soldier was found alive, searching a refrigerator in the panic room. The HVI was found dead inside, and Victor found dead outside. The rangers weren't able to physically identify Victor, but they knew he was high ranking because of his unusual tattoos. Dunn took photos of his tattoos and sent them in for analysis. Next up is the mission, the only easy day was yesterday. It's a fairly short level, but has one of the highest chances of melee deaths, as well as complex dialogue skips. Additionally, the final breach area is quite difficult to clear consistently. After escaping the favela, General Shepard tells Soap that he and his group are now heading for Prisoner 627 and a joint ops with Navy SEALs to get a step closer to getting Makarov. Playing as Roach, we first have to wait 90 seconds for a cutscene to play out. Next we'll take out this guard and wait an additional 30 seconds. Then we shoot this enemy over by the railing and proceed to enter the first breach. We must kill everyone as fast as possible because as soon as this is completed, a lengthy series of dialogue will start. The second breach is fairly complicated, as it seems dependent on which voice line it's completed on. The enemies will drop random SMGs, specifically UMPs, Vectors, and P90s. If any of them drop a P90, we'll prioritize on picking that up. Then we'll place some C4, and turn around to face Soap, and the hostages, which will trigger the sequence where hostages are led away. If we don't face them, the helicopter that spawns in later in the level will have a very small chance of shooting at Soap, and hitting the hostages as collateral, failing the mission. After about 13 seconds of placing the C4, this gate will open and we'll need to make a run to the helicopter. As we're traversing the map, we'll throw flashbangs to stun enemies so that we don't have to spend time killing every single one that gets in our way. Flash enemies possess somewhat of a distorted hitbox, so we'll need to avoid colliding into them or getting meleeed by them. 
When we reach the top level, we'll shoot a grenade to the left of the closest breach door to us, and then a second one near the forklift. If this is done correctly, there should be no enemies left in the area, and we can breach immediately. In the final breach, we eliminate everyone again, and then run to the helicopter, but it's important to not look behind, or actually get on it, because this allows Soap to catch up almost instantaneously and save time. Picking up right after the events of the last mission, we take the helicopter to the Gulag, which is a long level with many specific things required to save small amounts of time. First we'll shoot some enemies on the tower, and if Soap says, shift right, we'll know that they're dead and not just stunned. The only two enemies that matter on the second tower are those that come out of the small building. When Hornet21 says, ready, after Soap says, stabilize, we'll spam out seven shots with a decent horizontal spread to maximize our chance of shooting them. There are only 10 bullets in our magazine, so we leave a few extra, just in case the shots miss. For the rest of the helicopter section, no other enemies matter, so we just have to wait for the landing. The next part is kind of weird, as we'll be killing one random teammate before we start to run. The section of this level is essentially an escort mission to get Soap and Ghost to their respective positions further in the level. However, we'll be performing specific steps to set up a 10 second time save that begins after killing the teammate. We proceed to move through a horde of enemies, and once we see two enemies at the end of the hallway in the control room, we shoot a grenade at them and then turn around. The teammate that was killed respawns, and as soon as he is on level with us and ahead, we toss a grenade at his feet, causing him to sprint, which is slightly faster than the fast walk they do. Then we run ahead of him and proceed to kill the enemies in the first cell. Now we're going to face the wall inside the cell for a brief moment so that our teammate does not stop to shoot the enemies we leave alive, and also to teleport ghosts. This allows Ghost to start his dialogue about 10 seconds faster than normal. Killing everyone in the next section will prevent Soap and the others from slowing down to take shots, so this is important. Now we're mainly just waiting for Ghost to open the gates so that we can reach the armory in the center of the map. While this is happening, we want to try and find a P90 or Vector, and swap for it while also keeping our M4 grenade launcher. Due to invisible walls on the broken stairs, we can perform a clean strafe jump into the armory from the top of the broken stairs. We line ourselves up to throw grenades at this wall on the right, and when Soap says, Ghost, open the door, we throw three grenades, and then use a grenade launcher on three enemies that spawn in front. There's another skip that can save roughly 10 seconds, known as stair skip. Successfully doing the skip serves a few things, such as not having to wait for the armory door to open, and activating some triggers down below that spawn enemies. The first part involves strafe jumping left against a bent pole on the broken stairs in order to ascend up. We head towards a one-way invisible wall, which we'll be dropping down from, but make sure to touch this raffle box first, as there is a trigger on it, which will cause us to teleport back to it. After dropping down from the invisible wall, we activate some triggers down below that spawn enemies. When we get teleported back to the raffle box, the enemies will despawn, making the next section easier. There's no visual or audio cue for the raffle box trigger, and if we fail to touch it before dropping down from the invisible wall, we're pretty much softlocked. If stair skip is successfully done, all we have to do is run through solitary confinement without worrying about enemies. But if we fail it, solitary confinement is cramped with enemies and can be extremely annoying. Once through, we'll start the breach when Ghost says, the old shower room's about 30 feet ahead of you on the left. If we start it before this, the game will softlock later on. We dodge yet another horde of enemies and make our way to the second breach. This is where we find prisoner 627, revealed to be Captain John Price, who was captured by Macroft soldiers during Operation Kingfish. So it borders him to drop the weapon, and the old friends are reunited. Now we must hurry to reach the expo point, however the walls begin caving in. Price will free us, and the team will escape from the gulag with a spy rig that is detached to the payblow. For the last mission of Act 2, of their own accord, elements of the US Army are recuperating an evacuation center, which is beneath the Washington Monument in Washington DC. Unfortunately the site has come under attack by Russian forces that are advancing into the DC area and the site must be evacuated by the helicopter group Reaper 2. Playing as Private Ramirez, nothing matters until we clear out the crow's nest, so the goal is to get up there as fast as possible. The ceiling is pretty low, so we'll need to crouch if we want to strafe jump. Also, if an enemy tries to melee us on the stairs, they will always hit us, so it's a good idea to stun or kill them before they can do so. After arriving in the crow's nest, we need to kill every enemy to start Foley's dialogue. Now we're going to set up 8 claymores in the corners of the room to prepare for the next wave of enemies. Getting on the sniper here after planting the claymores saves 4 seconds due to more dialogue skips. Then we target a BTR back at the crow's nest with a javelin and wait for the dialogue to finish. When Foley says negative negative, that's when we fire the first shot. For the second shot we can aim for whatever we like, and then a helicopter on the third shot. Next we run back to the door and wait for our allies to breach it, 
We need to make sure that we aren't angled in such a way that our teammates actually trap and soft lock us in the door. Finally, we run to the roof as fast as possible and enter the second helicopter. During the next three minutes, nothing matters, so we just have to sit back and wait. Our helicopter eventually goes down, and Ramirez and several other rangers survive. Private Wade hands us an M4A1 with a full magazine, but gets hit by a stray bullet in the process. The squad fends off as many Russian troops as possible with what ammo remains. After using up the last magazine Sergeant Foley gives us, a searchlight shines on us, waiting out the screen as the level ends. The start of Act 3 opens with Contingency, where Captain Price carries out a plan to end the war in the United States. We once again play as Roach, alongside Captain Price and Ghost. While clearing the enemies on this bridge, we need to be careful not to shoot any cars, otherwise Price will stop and wait for them to explode before moving past. There is yet another level ending soft lock that can occur, and is most likely caused if an enemy on the bridge is still alive as we move into the forest. As we navigate the forest, it's important to avoid detection so that Price doesn't slow down by 10 to 20 seconds. If we fail to jump onto this hill and under the pipe, it isn't too critical, but it will slow down Price again by about 1 to 5 seconds. Past the houses at the bottom of the hill are a horde of enemies, and we mow through them with the M240 that we picked up. Next we pull out our Predator and shoot the bottom left corner of the helipad. If done correctly, this will destroy both the helicopter and the BTR. The rest of the level is an escort mission, and our time is entirely dependent on how fast Price gets into the submarine. We basically want him to be distracted by enemies as little as possible. We clear out the left side of this yard with a fresh light machine gun and RPG. Then we pull out the Predator and shoot wherever the largest group of enemies are. On top of the guardhouse, we take out more RPG ammo and use it on the jeep that spawned on the dock. We kill more enemies around the guardhouse and dock area and use a Predator once more. After destroying the two trucks to the east, we enter the yard using the same gap from when we left to go towards the guardhouse. Now we need to backtrack through the level, following the same route used when going to the guardhouse. When our Predator is usable again, we use it on two more vehicles that just spawned. Ideally we want to be behind the bridge, overlooking the base when the ending dialogue starts, and pretty much just sit here until the level ends. When Price gets to the submarine, he launches a ballistic missile into the upper atmosphere where it detonates, creating an EMP which disables all electronic devices all across the eastern United States. It succeeds in pacifying some of the most intense fighting around Washington, D.C., and ensures the survival of Sergeant Foley and the men from the Ranger Regiment in D.C. The shockwave from the EMP also destroys the International Space Station. The next mission is Second Sun, which picks up right where, of their own accord, left off, with Private Ramirez's team having been shot down. We first take control of Sat-1, an unnamed astronaut located outside the International Space Station. Right off the bat, we wait around for about 70 seconds and then look to the right side of Earth. This is the astronaut's point of view during the mission of their own accord. The EMP that Sat-1 is observing is what destroyed the International Space Station and ultimately also killed him. After about 80 seconds, we switch back to Private Ramirez and equip a Grenadier and head to the next building. As we follow fully to the next building, there's a lot of waiting around for dialogue to play out, roughly 20 to 30 seconds at a time. Once we're inside this building, we can either stick with our M9 or grab a second M4 Grenadier to use to avoid having to reload. Enemies begin spawning when Foley says, you heard the man, let's go, and we fire the grenade launcher into the left side of the room. Killing too many enemies will cause the next wave to spawn earlier, which is a huge risk factor, so it's best we only kill two enemies during the section. Ultimately, this is one of the scariest sections in the game, because it's very easy to get meleeed and lose nearly a minute of time. Once we clear out as much of this building as we can, we hit the streets to clean out the enemies there. Two enemies will be hiding near cars, and a small group behind the bus. Then we head down to the bunker doorway, and it's important to not stop and grab a different gun during the section, or be too slow in general, because this can actually soft lock the level. Once done and fully teleport down, we wedge ourselves in front of the door so we can walk through as soon as Dunn opens it. This bunker is within the Eisenhower building, and Dunn hopes that everyone inside managed to get out in time as the screen fades to black. Next up is Whiskey Hotel, which picks up immediately after the previous mission. The team emerges onto the south lawn of the White House and meets up with Colonel Marshall. Marshall explains and shows fully that despite the MP blast price causes, the White House, now fortified by the occupying ultranationalists, still has power. He deduces that they should be able to contact Central Command from there if they can retake the White House. Top speedrunners perform a strat called Foley Skip, which is arguably the hardest trick in the game. Basically it allows for Foley to move through different areas of the map much faster, which speeds up the level by quite a bit. First we use our M9 to shoot in front of Foley and stagger him, and then turn around the corner to perform two strafe jumps. Then we immediately pull out a grenade and throw it in the general direction of Foley. 
If done correctly, he should run back to the start of the level and lay down. But we don't have enough time to tech though, because we need to get to the west wing as fast as possible. The point we need to cross is about halfway between the two doorways of the west wing, which should be crossed at about 33.5 to 35 seconds after starting the level. This is a tiny bit dependent on whatever Foley is doing at the stage. If Foley runs all the way into the room and stays there, then that means the trick was a success. We need to keep moving consistently enough after Dunn opens the door so that Foley doesn't take cover. If we do everything correctly, Foley will be near the door that Dunn opened, and will be sprinting on his way to open the next door. Then we make our way to the roof atop the level and activate our flare. As the jets fly off, more green flares can be seen across the city, signifying that the US armed forces have succeeded and retaken the city. The rangers then discuss the possibility of invading Russia to exact revenge upon them. In the mission loose ends, General Shepard sends Task Force 141 to two different locations in order to find Makarov. Soap and Price go to the Boneyard in Afghanistan, while Roach and the other members head to a safe house on the Georgian-Russian border. The first thing to do is strafe down this hill, but not too fast or it risks breaking our legs, and we'd have to start the level over. When we get to the mine area, we'll need to B hop a couple of times to get as far ahead as possible and then switch it prone before the mines explode. If we don't travel far enough, there's a reasonably high chance we die by an RPG. Shortly after the mines will be stunned, so we toss a flashbang to cancel the effect, saving around 5 seconds. Then we continue up to this house, reach the front door, and kill the enemies located all throughout. Ideally we're looking for the dialogue, all clear, squad regroup on me, between a minute and a half to a minute and 40 seconds of level time. Regardless of where we are, we'll need to go back downstairs and grab claymores plus a WA-2000 and use the upcoming wait time to set up in the basement. After 40 seconds of dialogue, we'll set up a DSM to Macroft's computer to download the data from it. This download takes exactly 5 minutes and 12 seconds, and there's no way of getting around it. We mainly just need to survive during the section and defend the house from waves of enemies. After receiving the DSM, we make a run to the end of the level. As we cross the end trigger, the level won't end for another 2 minutes. But during this time, well if you've played this game before, you know what happens. At the extraction point, General Shepard personally walks out before commenting on cutting loose ends. He shoots Roach and then kills Ghost before he is able to react. Shepard grabs a DSM from Roach before two Shadow Company soldiers soak them in gasoline. Shepard tosses a cigar in their bodies, setting them on fire. Price's voice can be heard on Ghost's radio, warning them of Shepard's betrayal. But it's a bit too late for that. The enemy of my enemy is by far the most simple mission of the entire game. At the Afghanistan Boneyard, Soap continues his attempts to contact Ghost and Roach to no avail. Price states that Shepard is cleaning house, and tells Soap that Shepard is on his way to him. Interestingly enough, Price taps into Makarov's channels and offers to take out Shepard for Makarov, who ends up leaking Shepard's base of operations, site Hotel Bravo. The first section of the level is pretty much a strafing to the rally point and then entering a jeep. Half the men are Makarov's and the other half are Shepard's and they're both trying to kill us and each other at the same time. Because of the diverted gunfire, it's pretty easy to just run past unharmed. Once inside the jeep, all we need to do is kill a couple of enemies just to be sure we don't die. This includes a gunner at the start, and the two that appear to the right of us about 15 seconds later. Our driver Rook, a Task Force 141 soldier who survived Shepard's betrayal, gets killed by a stray bullet by Shadow Company forces, but his foot is still on the gas. Soap is forced to steer the jeep into the cargo hold of Nikolai C-130, and they manage to escape the boneyard. In the second to last mission, just like old times, most of Task Force 141 has been eliminated, and nearly out of allies that they can trust. Price and Soap determine that there is nothing left to do but to neutralize General Shepard. They embark on a suicide mission to infiltrate Hotel Bravo, the command base of Shadow Company, with one goal only, to kill Shepard. We'll need to provide Price with the fastest possible pathing so we'll first run to the top of this cliff and snipe the guy to the right. Then we'll jump down and kill all but one enemy and both dogs. When the enemies are alerted, we'll then go ahead and take out the last enemy. There's about a 1 in 8 chance for a Scar Grenadier to spawn, which can make clearing out the enemies before the final breach much safer and faster. After Price catches up, we'll rappel down and run past all the enemies. And the risk of dying here is pretty minimal. By looking directly at the floor when reaching the first set of stairs, we can force the game to despawn all enemies ahead of us. As we continue this path, the next three enemies need to be killed, or we lose some time due to extra dialogue, somewhere in the neighborhood of 6 seconds. As we cross this gap, it's ideal to stay left to line up as many collaterals as possible. We have to clear this entire area of enemies in order to be able to breach the next door. 
After Price catches up, we'll start the breach, and the next bit of dialogue will start as soon as all enemies are eliminated. From here we rush to the top of the hill to start the end cutscene. Shepard's been evacuated, and Price and So proceed towards the Shadow Company's watercraft called Zodiac in order to chase Shepard down an underground river. And at last, we enter the final mission, Endgame. Our final objective is to kill the rogue General Shepard before he escapes from Afghanistan. First we'll head over to Zodiac and not have to worry about too much at the start. RPGs are a threat, however they're very inaccurate, so it's not that hard to avoid them. As we exit out into the open, we'll keep to the far left to take the shortest path. When entering the rapids, we need to stay as straight as possible since we don't have much control over the watercraft. The next section can be unforgiving thanks to random RPGs or dying to the helicopter, so we'll keep doing our best to avoid them. There's yet another soft lock that can be encountered, albeit extremely rare and has only ever happened three or four times in the game's speedrunning history. Right before falling down the waterfall, the game can fail state despite Shepard being right in front of us. So yeah, that's a possibility. After loading into the final area, we'll walk straight while spamming left and right in order to walk as fast as possible. When Shepard spawns, we need to wait for him to get a little bit away from us before trying to knife him. If timed correctly, we'll lunge at him and catch up, and we'll continue this process all the way to the car. Shepard counters Soap and stabs him. After the screen fades back in, he gives a bit of dialogue talking about how he lost 30,000 men during the events of Modern Warfare and how the world just watched. He fully wants a war with Russia to happen, so that he can win and declare himself a war hero and have his name fully etched in history. Obviously since Price and Soap know of his wrongdoings, which goes all the way back to No Russian, where Shepard purposely tipped off to Makarov that Joseph Allen wasn't Russian, and the massacre at the airport was just a way to escalate the war, he wants them dead. As we're incapacitated, Price tackles Shepard, and we need to crawl to the gun. Shepard knocks us out, and in the next cutscenes, we see Price and Shepard go at it. As the screen fades into the knife in our body, we spam the interact key to activate Soap's hand, as waiting for the prompt to appear will take several seconds. As we remove the knife, we have to find a balance of spamming consistently fast, but not too fast, or we'll just flat out die from ripping it out. When aiming the knife at Shepard, we can actually throw it pretty early, instead of having to line it up directly at his face. The timing ends on the first frame the crosshair disappears, and Soap starts to throw the knife into Shepard's eye. Price eventually gets up and stumbles towards Soap to start bandaging his wounds. At that moment, Nikolai rolls up in a helicopter and exits to help assist. Price tells Nikolai that they need to get Soap out of here, to which Nikolai responds, Da, I know a place. The mission ends, and the credits roll. So yeah, despite this game having relatively few skips, unskippable cutscenes, and jarring movement tech, I personally find the speedrun really entertaining and super underrated. Special thanks to Survivor for helping us out with the script for this video and letting us use this PB for the background video. Also thanks to Kluger and Ekai for helping out as well. If you guys enjoyed today's video, be sure to leave a like as that's the best way to show support. As a reminder, you guys can get War Thunder on PS5, Xbox Series X, and S, and also on PC by using my link in the description. This game is really fun, looks great, and I really think you'd enjoy it if you checked it out. Thanks again to them for sponsoring this video. And that's all I have to say for today. Make sure to subscribe for more speedrunning related content. And as always, I hope you all have a beautiful life.